project between the folks at Virgin Falls and the city of Sparta. So we would like to thank the city of Sparta for allowing us to use this facility. Thank you very much. Thank you, because uh, we, we really appreciate working with Jeff and Jennifer and other folks over in City Hall to make this a possible and available. We, we think we have a real good agenda for this summer, and we do hope, in fact, to keep the agenda going longer than just this summer. Now, tonight, of course, is the famous set so he's going to be he's going to be starting here in just a little bit. Uh, but I uh, want to introduce some of the other speakers of the upcoming events, upcoming sessions. Next week will be. Um, Linda Mackey of the Bonaire, the coal mining in White County from the Bonaire Historical Society. She'll be here next week. Same time, same place, 7 o'clock uh, next Tuesday night. The following Tuesday night will be Randy Hedgepath, who is the state naturalist, is going to be talking about wildflowers. So both Linda and Randy will be great presentations. And the gentleman over there behind the camera will be the following week, Chuck Sutherland, cartographer, <laughs> caver extraordinaire, and... Um, one of the minions up at the Upper Cumberland Development District. He'll be speaking uh, after um, Randy Hedgepad the following week. And uh, then after that will be Sawyer Campbell. No, I'm sorry, Jackson Kayak will be the following week after that. He'll be talking about paddling the different waters and tributaries of the Canyon Fork system. So <coughs> where to paddle, there will be some paddling tips offered. So that'll be the following week. And then the week after that will be Sawyer Campbell, and he'll be talking about preparing for hiking and backpacking, some good strategies for that. And then I will follow up with, I, I was lucky enough to be the co-author of the book, Hiking Tennessee. Uh, so I'll be talking a little bit about some of my explorations in, in preparation for that book. Uh, in the last session of the series this summer will be Mr. Bob Salyer. Where is Bob? Oh, there you are. And Bob will be talking, well, what will you be talking about, Bob? Well, um, tips and tricks on photography. And it doesn't matter what camera you have, anything, it's just um, basic photography tips that hopefully will make you a better photographer. Also, um, we'll do a short uh, travel log type thing. Um, you know, I've taken tours to Yellowstone, Tetons, the Everglades, uh, Smoky Mountains, of course, and uh, Costa Rica. So um, we'll be talking about that um, a little bit. So we've got a great agenda lined up for the summer. We hope you come out. Every session is different. Every session has got some great speakers. So with that said, um, I've, been, I've known Seth for a long time. We've worked together on a lot of different projects over the years. He worked for the Cumberland Trail for a number of years over there building trails. He's worked up at the um, Outdoor Experience in Cookville. Y'all may have met him up there. And I guess this, this man's a master on different types of outdoor gear, but his love is mountain music and old time music and the history that goes with it. So that's what he'll be sharing with you tonight. So let's make welcome Seth Webster. Hey, yeah. All right, you guys still see? Yeah. There's a few more seats scattered, a random one or two, and there's about three or four right here. Uh, there's one more throne left here. Chuck's claimed one of them. Um, Jack, everybody hear me all right? Small room. We didn't want to amplify, so we thought we'd try it like this. Um, like Stuart said, my name is Seth Webster. Uh, I'm a conservation worker with State Parks, working in Virgin Falls, Dog Cove, and Lost Creek. Um, love the outdoors. Worked in outdoor retail for years. Tell people how to go outside, but now I'm going back to be outside some more. But what I love about State Parks is it's not just about natural history. You know, we see that beautiful rock up there. That picture by Mr. Chuck Sutherland all the way. I told him I'd give him credit every time his pictures are shown. Um, but, you know, we try to tie our history and our culture in the state parks. And White County has a rich culture that we're hoping the speaker series and will showcase some of that. And we have some wonderful organizations in the county we'd like to help give a little voice to, like today. Uh, we can talk about something that might not normally be talked about here. That being said, what I'm going to talk about today is old-time music of the Cumberland Plateau. Um, this is me right here on the right with the banjo with my buddy Nate Dodson who's actually a park ranger at David Crockett birthplace over in East Tennessee. <coughs> this was taken at the Virgin Falls dedication two years ago. Is that two years ago or three? Maybe three. It was a while ago. Uh, you can't tell it was actually January. It was about five degrees outside that day. Uh, we were freezing. <laughs> but
but we sounded good, at least in the picture we sound great. <laughs> What I'm going to talk about today is the old time music and the things that followed the settlers into this area when they first came here. Uh, and that baby crying's mine, so it's just fine. It's, <laughs> fine, right? it's part, of the, part of the music, all. right? It's part of the music. So first off, what is old time music? And by the way, I tend to ask questions. Feel free to answer them or look at me weird while it's all good. Um, poor little fella. <laughs> He doesn't like to sit still, so... Um, yeah, what is old time music? You've probably heard the term, you've seen the old pictures of this. Um, I've got albums all over the front. Actually, when I say album, I mean album. I don't mean a CD or a tape. These are actually albums I've got up here. Some of these old recordings. Um, and I've got some notes here I'm going to try to take of it. Um, so old time music is a thing all its own. It's a kind of uniquely American, especially southern, American Southern Appalachian kind of thing. Um, where it comes from is where most of our settlers came from in this area. The original settlers were Celtic, you know, Scottish, Irish, British Isles, uh, some of them were from Germany. Um, but they took that group of cultures, these are rough people living out here in the middle of the woods, you know, very strong, very hardy. And they took their music with them, but they also brought some influences from the African. Um, so this is the big question though. If I get this, and also you guys are the guinea pigs, the first time I've ever done this presentation, so don't be too harsh. There we go. I actually wrote it out. My wonderful wife helped me with this. So like I said, yeah, it's a precursor of bluegrass and country, uh, developed from a mix of Irish, English, and African influences. But this is the question of the day, usually. People say what's different, because Sparta, Tennessee, is Bluegrass USA, isn't that the title of uh, when they say Sparta? Bluegrass is wonderful. I love bluegrass. You know, we have done well with promoting it here in Sparta. We have, you know, Home of Lester Flat, Benny Martin. Um, but what we're talking about today predates all that stuff. This is the stuff that was brought here by the early settlers. But similar instruments. You're going to see banjos, fiddles. What's the difference? Anybody have any clue what the difference is? Like I said, I'm going to ask questions. Makes you keep you from being between a, between a fiddle and a No, violin. between old time and bluegrass music. Like I said, if you see some guys playing fiddle and banjo and stuff, how do you know they're playing old time versus bluegrass? The rhythm? Yeah, it, the language is a little bit different, but you really know it right there, the rhythm. The rhythm is very different from this. Um, okay, so old time is a little different. It usually has a fiddle lead. A lot of times, the old times when they first came in, they only had a fiddle. They didn't have the full bands and everything. So the fiddle was the lead instrument, played the melody. Um, very rhythmic style, and it was part of the African influence that came in that the banjo pulls out. Um, one thing that you see a lot in bluegrass, you don't see it all the time as much in the early, early stuff, is there was no guitars. Guitars, even this guy here is 115 years old, uh, but they didn't have these till those days. So Sears and Roebuck got popular, and people could mail order guitar to their house. You didn't see these on the plateau back in these back areas. Um, in contrast to that, bluegrass is going to be evolved from it. But it's a primarily a vocal style. You know, you'll see those wonderful three and five, and I've heard eight-part harmonies in bluegrass. In old time, they're singing. There's some wonderful singing, but a lot of time it's hollered out. You know, there's a, there's a, a call for a dance. Um, with bluegrass also, there's no real lead instrument. Where the fiddle is leading the whole show, in bluegrass, you know, they all take turns. The banjo will step up, the guitar will step up, and they'll do some wonderful solos and stuff. It's a little different. And in that same note, it's performance-based. Whereas bluegrass was made to stand in front of the stage and play, those old time players can sit in the back and face the wall. And we don't care because you guys are going to be dancing and enjoying music. That's just fine with us. So what I've done is tried to break this into three categories. Uh, and those categories being the things I can do. I'm a one man band so I can't do it all at once. So what I'm going to do first is show you the lead instrument. That would be the fiddle. So like I said, the fiddle one of its reasons it was most popular, because it's an old instrument, you know, they've been various of the fiddles for five or six hundred years at least. Um, compare that to any other instrument up here. What's so unique about that? It's tiny, you know, you're carrying uh, all your possessions in a horse, a wagon, something like that. This is going to be the one thing you don't leave at home, because you can take it. Um, also, it's a standalone instrument a lot of times. When they're playing, uh, you know, they're not getting to spend a lot of time in leisure. They're getting to have hard, hard work and then maybe a, a break at the end of the day or the end of the month, maybe harvest time or something. So they're going to make sure this guy's here so they can have that good time. 
So what I've done, I've picked out some tunes, and most of what I've picked out are tunes from this Upper Cumberland region. Unfortunately, White County was not visited by some of these early folklorists back in the 70s and stuff. Uh, Pope Creek? Nope. They pick it, but close. Okay. Yeah. That's Mr. Clyde Davenport here. I'll mention him again in a second. Um, where's that? Pickett State Park? Yeah, I lost it for a second there. Um, <laughs> So I've I tried to pick out the songs from this area. Like I said, White County was not visited by these early folklorists. Um, a lot of what I've got is stuff that's been collected over the years. But unfortunately, White County got missed. And this is something I always ask in this area. If you have a grandpa or a great-grandfather or somebody in your history that played these instruments in the pre-bluegrass country styles, I want to talk to you. We don't know much about Sparta's early history, and we don't know much about the bands that played here, but we know they were here because they had dances just like they did everywhere else. Um, so if you have any knowledge on that, please come talk to me later. First tune I'm going to attempt to play here is a very unique tune. Um, it's called Zolly's Retreat. This man right here is Claude Davenport. He is still living. I believe he's 98 years old. He's one of the, not in this picture, but he's one of the last of the old-time fillers that learned from his father, who learned from his father, who learned from his father. So there's, a, there's very few, if any, of them left besides him. Um, he can still play. His hearing's not so great, so he's a little off. But his technique is still in his fingers if you watch him play. And this tune is called Zolich Retreat. Uh, it's based after Felix Zollicoffer. Everybody familiar with Felix Zollicoffer? He should be very familiar to anybody interested in Upper Cumberland history. He was the general um, that led most of the troops out of this area, the Confederate troops from this area. Um, he got killed. He did get killed. And this is what this is about. So in Mill Springs, Kentucky, which is just maybe 20, 30 miles across the border. I've been there once, but I couldn't tell you exactly. Mill Springs, Kentucky, Zollicoffer decided to attack against, uh, I believe it was Johnston. Told him not to, so I'm going to sit still. He uh, attacked the Union, built some uh, earthworks up. And uh, before the, during the middle of the battle, Zollicoffer is seeing the smoke and the haze and all that stuff. And so he goes along the edge of this little ravine, they say, going through the smoke to he thinks seeing his own troops. Well, it turns out they recognize him. He's not looking at his own troops. He's looking at the Union troops. So he was shot uh, three or four times and died right there on the field. This was the end of the battle, pretty much. The Confederates lost heart and retreated. Um, what's unique about this guy right here, Clyde Davenport's grandfather, I believe his name was Frank. Frank was at that battle. And Frank supposedly witnessed Zollicoffer's death on the battlefield. So when you talk about stuff that passes over, you know, he was there. So I'm going to attempt to play this tune. One of the things unique about the plateau, um, they had this thing called solo fiddle pieces. Step into the light when you play, please. There? A little more. You're on camera. <laughs> yeah, I'm blind. Well, yeah, if you, can, if you can manage that, that's best for the video. Hard. Thank you. <laughs> So, uh, one of the things that's unique around here is, you know, a lot of the fiddle tunes, you've heard the fast tunes that always keep the same rhythm. Well, they have these unique solo pieces where they're impossible to play with. Nobody can play with some of these songs because the rhythms change constantly. They're slow, they're fast, they're a little bit all over the place. And this is one of those that was made to be a solo piece played for an audience. Um, I'm going to attempt to play it. This is kind of a tough one, so let's see what I can do here. But when you listen to it, it's, I want to be depressing, but it's almost like a funeral dirge. Think about the Confederate soldiers retreating after watching Zollicoffer being killed, so. Think still in tune?
One of the things you'll notice that's different about Appalachian fiddling in the old time style is these drone notes that... What does that sound like? Think about the Celtic roots. Bagpipes. That's exactly it. They made their fiddles tuned differently. They would have what's called cross keys where you'd have two matching strings here or matching strings across instead of the normal E, A, D, G. This tuned D, D, A, D. So you can get those long... There's two of us. We could do a, quite a good bagpipe jig right now. Um, but that's very unique to this style. It doesn't exist in anything except for a little in Irish, but not quite. Right. Anybody have any questions about Zolly's Retreat? I'm going to take questions along the way so I don't forget everything at the end. <laughs> Next tune, five miles out of town. I'm not sure what town. <laughs> <laughs> this is a unique tune from this area. This, both of these tunes really come from the Northern Plateau area around the Kentucky border. Um, and this tune comes from this guy right here. That's Fiddlin' John Sharp, um, his daughter Evelyn, and a Mr. Morris. I'm not sure what his first name was. But what was unique about him was he was the most amazing technical field fiddler that was recorded in these mountains in those years. Um, there may have been more, but he was the only one that survived as far as recordings. Um, don't really know more about this tune other than they're five miles out of some town. Um, it was a really lively dance tune, and you know, a, a setup like this would have been ideal for a square dance after a... Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, a barn raisin or any cliche you think you can think of, they really did those things, you know. They did cut the hay as a group sometimes. And they got together and played music and danced and enjoyed some of the other things that were made in this area uh, that were liquid form. Um, <laughs> but let's see, I don't think I wrote anything down about what this one is. Oh, what's unique about this tune, the recording that we got from John Sharp was recorded in 1949 over at Alvin C. York's house. See, they were practically neighbors, not very far away, and Alvin C. York had a record cutter. So he went over there multiple times, 1949 and maybe 64, and played for Alvin, even Alvin's older days. He may actually have passed away by the second recording, his family did it, but pretty neat to say, you know, these, this legend of old time in this area, and then this legend known throughout the world for his heroic feats in World War I. This is one of my favorite tunes here. I love playing this one. Same thing, a little different tuning, not quite as deep, but... Still in tune. But you still got that drone, so let's see if we can do it here. I got a little rhythm with this one. Mississippi Sawyer, you know, it's not totally unique to this area. It was well known throughout the South. Um, I just really like this tune. Um, what's unique about this one, though, he's not quite a plateau guy, but this is Charlie Acuff, where I get this version. Anybody ever see him at all around playing? He's a cousin of Roy Acuff. Uh, he'll quick to tell you that, but he was an incredible fiddler in his own right. He played uh, solo for quite a few years. He played with the uh, Lantana Drifters. I don't know if you guys ever saw them. They were out of Crossville, Earl and Audine Webb. They played at Fall Creek Falls at the Mountaineer Folk Festival quite a few times. Um, but Charlie was very unique. He had a very smooth fiddle stroke. So hopefully I can capture a little bit of this. And he's, he's playing left-handed. He is. He was a left-handed fiddler. That's really good, 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 good eye there. Um, anybody knows what a Sawyer was? It's not what you think, I guarantee it. Because I had to look it up again. He doesn't have a sawmill. Doesn't have a sawmill. So this tune is not Mississippi's in the state of Mississippi, the river. And what I found out from the research I did uh, through a guy named Charles Wolf, a sawyer was a log in the river where it had came down with the roots. The roots got trapped. And so you think about this thing being trapped underwater. You've seen them move around like that. 
and they'd all of a sudden pop up from an unsuspecting boat. And obviously a small kill or something like that would be uh, destroyed by a, a boat or a log popping up in the middle of the Mississippi as you're going down. So, like I said, they don't always write about good things. Maybe this is a warning song, but it's a really happy song. So, let's see. And this would have been a very good dance tune. A lot of these songs, too, they have no end. And we have played square dances where I've played the same tune for 9 and 12 minutes at a time. And I slowly let my fiddle down and my arms go, and I'm looking and saying, somebody make them stop. Um, <laughs> uh, and this is, a lot of these tunes are like that. No, no beginning, no end. They just play up until they get tired. Or, or the dancers collapse on the floor like that little guy back there. That's a Celtic form of audio. Yes, mm -hmm, absolutely. Come from the reels. Yep. All right, so here's Mississippi Star. Let me see if I can get this one. Questions about fiddles? What you got? Yeah, well, I notice these guys. A lot of them play with the fiddle up under their chin, but you play it on your forearm. Um, is that your style? Or that's partly my style. I don't know if I can go back on this PowerPoint or not. Well, he's not doing it there. He's so the Clyde normally played down here. Okay. And from my research that I found, a lot of people did back then because, say, you were a solo fiddler playing for the dance, you're doing the calling, you know, telling the square dancers what to do. You can't do that and do like yeah, that. Yeah. So this lets you get free to move and also notice it lets people, you can dance as you go. You can jump in and join the crowd. Um, but really, there's no real reason that I know. I just like to play the way that's how I learned and that's how I stay. But um, I couldn't really tell you any more than that, though. Okay. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, some fiddlers that are very good will say you can get a little more reach right here. And that's very true. But I've seen this guy do some stuff that was incredible that other people can't replicate even right here. So I don't know if that completely holds water or not. But... You have to ask a better fiddler than me. <laughs> but has got any questions about these guys? And you're free to come up afterwards. I'd ask you not to touch the instruments unless you uh, ask me back and show them to you. But uh, they how, are pretty how old are those instruments? So this one, as I like to tell this, so this one's probably mid 50s, not that old. I just bought it off an old timer who belonged to his grandfather, I believe. So not super old. This guy though is is awesome. So this guy, all we know is it was made before 1890. I don't I don't know wow. when exactly. And the reason we know this. You always heard, uh, there's an old, Grandpa has an old Stradivarius in the closet. Yeah. Well, he may, but, you know, why you're sitting here not in your multi-million dollar vehicle, that's a whole different question. Um, Stradivarius are obviously were built in the 1700s, some of the most well-built instruments of all time, they say. Um, but because his design was so ideal, they copied it. All these are really Strad copies. Um, what makes me know is before 1890, was after 1890, they made them put the country of origin. So mine says Antonio Stradivarius, 17, something, something, something inside. Most of them would say Germany, Stradivarius, da, 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 da. So mine not having the country origin says it probably predates 1890 before that law was enacted. 
Only other thing I know about this, and this is really cool, you're welcome to look at this later. See, it's got a Scottish thistle carved into the back of it. So it makes me think it's Scottish, obviously, but I have found nobody that knows anything about it. So if you know, I'd love to know. <laughs> and what else is special about this fellow, too? You know, I said Clyde's, he's 90 something years old now, and he's lost a little bit of his dexterity and everything. He helped me sand the fingerboard down. He put the little feet that are on the bottom of that bridge right there for me, so that's very special to me. Sure. Uh, now, onto the banjo. <coughs> I heard somebody talking about it before I, before I got up here and started talking. You know, this is the instrument that really pushes old time. Besides the rhythm of the fiddle, the percussive qualities of the banjo are what really makes old time stand out differently. Um, back to the other thing, what they play is what's called claw hammer. I heard somebody mention that earlier. Um, claw hammer is a very unique style to this, uh, um, this genre of music. Being played more modernly with some other stuff right here, but what makes it unique is uh, this is kind of technical if you're going to read it, but if you don't want to, I'll just show you. What it means when you see bluegrass banjo, you're up picking, and I can't do it. I'm not a good bluegrass. If anybody can bluegrass banjo, please pick it and then show it. Um, but in claw hammer, you're down picking. You're actually making your hand this little claw type shape. I'm hitting the melody note with my pointer or my second finger, so, and I'm doing it on a downstroke with my wrist instead of letting my fingers move like that. It's a downstroke of my whole wrist. And then at the end of it, on the offbeat, you catch that fifth string. So it's a, it's a little bit out of tune. See? Very different from what bluegrass sounds like. Where bluegrass can play a little more melodically, this has got that percussive. And if you play it right, you can see not as much on this one as you can the other one. You can see the imitations where my thumb's been hitting. On some songs, I really try to do that more so. So you get a little more of that rhythm with it. Um, I think I actually wrote about the difference here. Okay, no, I didn't. So banjo obviously is an African instrument, actually African inspired instrument. What they came over with and uh, made so popular was a gourd instrument with a stretched skin, usually fretless, which means it didn't have these little frets and you can do some cool slides and stuff. Um, usually a gut string let a real plunky sound, very, very rhythmic if you've ever heard that style of banjo. Um, the banjo in its mostly modern form comes from a guy named Joe Walker Sweeney who is a minstrel banjo player in I believe 1850 or 1830? 1830s. So what he did is he kind of standardized the style of banjo. You know, you've got a, a regular round hoop made of bent wood versus a gourd or something. Um, a little more straight fretboard, but he also added this fifth peg which was not unique at that time. It was done on other African instruments and some Moroccan instruments, but he made it standard. So that's where you get that, that, that little plunk at the end on the offbeat. That's where that comes from. He's the one that made it popular. Um, the song I'm going to play here is called Going Across the Sea. It's actually a really <coughs> popular song. Been recorded more recently, well, very recently, but when I'm, we're talking old time, 100 years ago, it was recent. Um, <laughs> the Carter family recorded this in their own version. Um, this version, Come from that guy with the fiddle who is trick playing. I can't, I can't banjo that. See him right here with the fiddle behind him. Uh, I'm not going to attempt that. But his name was Clarence Farrell. He's from Alpine, Tennessee. Uh, great fiddle player, great banjo player, great singer. Um, and this is one of my favorite songs because it's got a really rhythmic kind of plunk to it. But I'll play it for you real quick. song should be familiar to most of you in one form we or the other. This is, this is Cumberland Gap. So everybody's familiar with that one? Yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, String Bean, yes. country music artist, mm -hmm. he 
played that old time. Mm -hmm. The Opry guys, Uncle Blunt Stevens, who's one of the first people recording the Opry, uh, can't remember what song it was. They were old time players at that time, but they didn't become country until some of this other stuff got moved over the Carter family and everything. So, um, I love this next thing. Everybody's heard a couple of gap, right? It's, it's a bluegrass standard. It's an old standard. Um, you know what it refers to, right? Cumberland Gap. The uh, what makes it significant for old time is that was the gap that the uh, early settlers into the Middle Tennessee settlements came through on. I guess 1750. Dr. Thomas Walker. Um, this version I play is a little different, and I love playing with these old tunings and stuff. Um, so this is not gonna be like you normally heard Cumberland Gap. I don't know if this tuning is authentic to the time period, but I imagine without having an iPhone or a nice little handy tuner, they tuned to what they could. You know, I'm sure there was some kind of standardization. I know there was there was tuning forks back for hundreds of years, but I like to think the old timers got bored and figured out what they wanted to. And if it sounded good, they played it. So this, obviously, this guy's got a real high pitch, real low, uh, and this is actually a bluegrass banjo. This belonged to my great grandmother. <coughs> Difference being the open back. See? This guy's wide open. That's where that big plunky sound comes from. It gets kind of absorbed and falls out of the instrument. Where in a bluegrass banjo, it resonates. It's called a resonator. Resonates off the back and then pops up these little holes right here. It gives a little higher pitch sound. Really lets it cut through in the bluegrass song. You know, when you've got five, six instruments playing or four or five vocal harmonies going, the little picking in that higher tone comes through a lot better. It sounds really good. Um, but I like it because this one really, in this tuning it really rings, it's a really deep tuning. Um, this version I got here is kind of based off these folks right here. These are the Rocky Toppers who were also out of the Jamestown area. They recorded back in the, uh, I guess, 70s, I believe, 70s, 80s. I've got some of their stuff down here. Um, but they were a rock and dance band. They were, they were the ones you wanted to call when you wanted to have a party. In fact, there's a uh, whole thesis written about music in the Big South Fork. And they talk about uh, having parties in a rock corps. And one of the guys that, that went to the rock corps back in the early 80s uh, said it was the wildest thing he'd ever seen in his life. He said these mountaineers came out here, and I mean, this is the 80s, this is not that long ago. He said there was people just drinking moonshine and just running around, but always having good music going, these people were dancing. And he said, he'd see, walk out there and see a teenager over there spray painting on the side of the uh, uh, quarry. And then you see a 90-year-old lady over here just cutting a rug, just having a blast. So it really speaks to what I think the, uh, the old days would have been like back there. You know, more than just a good time, this is something we had to do to get our, uh, get our emotions out after having a, a, a really hard work time. Um, and so this version is a little different, though, so you may not recognize the way it's played, but I really like it and hope you will, too. It's very rhythmic. This tune, I only know three tunings, but I gotta say, hey Evelyn, my little five year old here, this tune's perfect for this. Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> the history on those 
band? Was it an old instruments or they? No, this is uh, probably from the mid '70s. Like I said, it was given to my great grandmother, who just finger picked a little bit on it. Not a real big player, but it, it was her so special. This yeah. guy I bought when I was a seasonal working with the uh, Cumberland Trail with my big steak money I earned. Then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I spent all of it in one shot. <laughs> uh, so this song, and I'm not going to really play much of this. This is just to showcase something unique to this area too. They're, the three finger style, the Scrug style that you know for bluegrass, mm -hmm. originated, has some record before Earl Scruggs. He didn't make it up completely, but he refined it. Uh, but we had two finger and three finger style picking here way, way back before you end that stuff. Um, and this guy really showcases it good. This is a um, Virgil Anderson right there. Uh, quite a character. I've got some of his albums right here. I don't know if I have my other good picture or not. No, I don't. Um, Anyway, he was part of uh, a family of timber cutters and coal miners, rough folks. These guys had a party all the time. There's a wonderful picture of the whole family back in the 20s, 30s. They're all holding pistols and scowling, and he's in the back of the fishing pool like he's about to smack somebody. <laughs> Three years old. Um, but he was a character, um, and his style is very unique. His songs were unique. <coughs> a lot of the ones he wrote himself or developed out of something older. Um, he, he did, uh, my great-grandmother who passed away several years ago, said uh, when she was up there helping Quilt, he uh, flirted with her a little bit. You know, she's 80-something at the time. He's <laughs> and and uh, flirted with her a little bit. He said, man, that old man is full of trouble. Which <laughs> uh, I thought was cool. And he also sings a song called Trouble. But I'm just going to play a little quip of what that style would have sounded like if I can get in the right tune in here. players are always tuning. Okay, so like I said, this is a two-finger style, and what's also unique that's not in bluegrass is the brushes. So now I'm not up-picking like bluegrass, but I'm doing this brushing thing, so. videos of this guy playing uh, uh, they're incredible he's dancing around just acting nuts um, so the next section is about and this is where I'm going to leave you because I play all these instruments but I do not sing <laughs> but luckily there's some wonderful folks out there that do um, ballads are obviously part of Appalachian and Southern culture uh, they're so important because you know these are party songs and good times good times and laments these songs were stories these were stories of either Something that happened 500 years ago. Some of these stories and ballads were collected, uh, came from British Isle stuff. We don't know the origins. We know they're three or 400 years old. And there's other stories that talk about a murder that somebody in the community witnessed or heard about in the newspaper. And they're going to sing about it because that's what you do back then. Um, and luckily, we had some pretty incredible ballad singers in this area. These two are perhaps my absolute favorite for the Cumberland Plateau. First one out there, Mr. D. Hicks. So Dee lived in uh, what they call Tenchtown, which is, I think, a little bit south of James County, still in Fentress County. Um, <coughs> Dee is very unique because he's a traditional ballad singer in the old ways. He learned from his father, his grandfather, and they trace their family history back to, in this area, to the 1815 um, time period. And when these families moved in, Dee's family moved in 1815 to the area, they never left. 1975, they were still living in the same area, and within the same mile that their ancestors uh, were in. And if you've been up in that country, you know, it's kind of like what some of the stuff we have in some of our parklands, they're rough. 
They're rough. You don't go to town unless you absolutely have to or you're forced to. Um, so they developed their own style. Uh, one of the things that's unique about this area too is they say even as late as the turn of the century, uh, they still heard some dialects and everything that were distinctly Irish and British. So stuff that just got hidden away and never disappeared and mass culture didn't dilute that. So pretty neat to think that uh, uh, they're still speaking the same way they would have been 300 years ago. This first song is an old one, obviously. Dee called it Young Napoleon. Um, it's obviously he meant Napoleon, but Napoleon is what he insisted it was called. Um, this is about the Bonnie Bunch of Roses. If you've ever heard of that, this is obviously a tune from the early 19th century uh, during the Napoleonic Wars. It refers to the uh, um, Napoleon trying to invade and not getting past the Bonnie Bunch of Roses, which the Bonnie Bunch of Roses were the British Isles. You couldn't beat those guys. They were going to stick together. Which, if you talk to the Irish in those days, they didn't quite have the same opinion. <laughs> but, and because of the way I set this up, all my songs are in iTunes. So this was recorded by Bobby Fulcher, who's the park superintendent of Criminal Trail State Park. Um, quite a few of these recordings are done by him. Back in the 70s, he was a naturalist and took it upon himself. He met some of these old-timers he took it upon himself to go out there to recorders and record these folks. If it wasn't for him, some of this stuff would have never been heard. Uh, <coughs> Dee actually has over 400 songs in the Library of Congress. Over 100 of them are unique to him in this area. So that's 100 songs, 400 versions of things that we would have lost without somebody like Bobby and some of these other people that did this. Um, so first off is Young Napoleon. Let me test out the volume here too. I don't want to blast you out with ballads. I learned this song, Young Napoleon, from my father, Daniel Hicks. He learned it from his father, Joseph Hicks, that brought it here to this country, Tennessee County, in Tennessee. Up step Young Napoleon, <coughs> and took his mother by the hand, saying, Mother, don't be angry, for I am able to command. I will take five hundred thousand, and across the mountains I will go, and I will conquer Moscow, and return with a bony bunch of roses, oh. But when he got to Moscow, him being overpowered by the ice and snow, but Moscow was a pleasing, so he lost his bony bunch of roses, oh. Then up spoke young Napoleon, as he lay upon his dying bed. Saying if I could have lived, I would have been glad. But oh, I've dropped my youthful head. Love his voice. Mm -hmm. So the next song here is his wife, Delta, who was also, she didn't have the same uh, background as Dee did, but she grew up around Dee's father and his grandfather who were bowed singers of the old sort. There's uh, stories in one of these albums here that talks about Dee's father. Would They'd have a party or something in the night. He would sit in his chair and close his eyes, tilt his head back, and sing till three or four in the morning. Some of these ballads, they said 15, 20 minutes long. Uh, what else is unique about Dee, too? I mean, that's one of his many, many songs he recorded. Um, he was functionally illiterate. He did not want to go to school, and after a certain amount of time, a number of whippings, his dad said, don't worry about it, let's go farm. So he couldn't read or write. Everything that he recorded was by memory. So pretty neat to think, you know, this is not some, maybe he wasn't educated mountaineer. Doesn't mean he was dumb. He was, these folks were smart people. They are hardworking, and they took these songs and talked about that kind of stuff. This next song that Dee's singing here is called Willie Moore. It's a more recent tune. It's got some possible roots to some other older songs. But what they think is this refers to a, uh, a, uh, something that happened back 100, 125 years ago. They don't know when. And this version comes from, these guys are here. This is Dick Burnett and Leonard Rutherford. Dick Burnett being the uh, um, 
banjo player right there. These guys traveled around the 20s and 30s around Monticello, Kentucky, and a lot of those areas there, um, playing music for money. That's what they did for a living. Um, he would play for money. Uh, Linda Rutherford would play for drinks and then lose all his money real quick. And then Dick Burnett would have to go find him somewhere in a bar. Um, but some of the songs they recorded were picked up by these mountaineers. When they didn't have radios and they didn't have record players, they still went out and heard somebody like this guy. And uh, so this is where we think Delta got her song. So I'll play it for you. Her voice is like these, very unique, um, very deep. She does have a little false start in there, so if you notice it's uh, stopping, she's not quite done. And I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly when they died, but Dad, where was that? Right there, remembers meeting them as a seasonal in 1979 at Pickett State Park. At Pickett, they held what started out to be the Sharp Family Reunion, eventually became the Old Timers Fest. Um, and when Dad was a seasonal there, Dee and Delta and some of these other folks, Virgil Anderson, Clyde, played there. So we got a chance to see some of them. So it's pretty neat. So here's Willie Moore. Debbie Dixon's going to sing a song now, Willie Moore, if I can. <laughs> Willie Moore was a king in his age of 22. He courted a damsel fair. Her eyes was as blue as the aces above and raised in black was her hair. Her eyes were as blue as the aces above and raised in black was her hair. He, he courted her by night and the day. Till his wife she agreed to be. They went to get her pharaoh's consent. Oh, they said that it never can be. Oh, they said it never can be. I love Willie Moore, she said to herself. As dear as I love my life. I'd rather be dead than to bear the thoughts that I can't be sweet Willie Moore's wife. I'd rather be dead than to bear the thoughts that I can't be sweet Willie Moore's wife. She flung herself in Willie Moore's arms as she'd often done before. But little did he think when they parted that night he'd never see sweet Anna anymore. That he would never see sweet Anna anymore. I'll pause it right there. That's a unique song in that even though it was said as a more recent tune, it, it calls him a king. Willie Moore was a king. Obviously, that came from an older time period. This all has been melded into what became Willie Moore the tune, but who knows what his history was. That's maybe telling about a story of a murder in 1300 something for all we know as is, is, well as some of these things are passed on. Um, but, you know, like I said, this was passed over years and years and years to the families to get to these points. The last tune I'm going to play done by a little more modern person here. This is old Cumberland Land. Um, and this performance is by Norman Blake, who I, you may have heard of him already. He's a, he's a wonderful uh, picker and singer that still plays. He played at Fall Creek Falls as recently as last year, maybe, or the year before at the Mountaineer Folk Festival. Um, but this is a wonderful tune dating probably back, I think we said the 17, late 1700s. Uh, don't know much about it and really listen to the lyrics. This is one thing that's really cool about this stuff. I don't want to do it because there's kids and everything. Turn off all the lights and just listen to these stories. Listen to the subject matter of this one. This depicts traveling down into the Cumberland land on the Avery Trace back in the turn of the centuries, the turn of the 1700s. Um, but listen to the things he talks about. I won't talk any more about it. I'll just let the word speak for it. The Cumberland land. Steered 
our way to the Cumberland land. When we got here, it was ice and snow. when this song was written, y'all. They did, they run across the burial ground. Nobody knows, but the story lives on, and we can still try to picture what it's like crossing through the mountains like that. But, very, very neat song. Any questions? The only thing I didn't cover tonight is religious music. That's a whole other topic in the Appalachians itself. Uh, maybe I'll work on that for another two-hour presentation. But, uh, not tonight. <laughs> on, on the ballads, like the first two were without without instrumentation. Mm -hmm. That one had a guitar, but you said the yes. old timers wouldn't Right. I just really so love that first song with a, a fiddle? Uh not usually not a ballad. Most of the time the ballad would have just been vocal the way D or Delta sung it. Um I'd like to say I just really like that version. It's the best version of Old Cumberland that I know. Yeah. Um yeah the ballads would have been saying a cappella. Usually solo. I don't know of many stories of ballad singers singing any harmonizing parts at all. Uh, there may be other, but I don't know those stories. So. The other questions about anything. We go all back to fiddle, banjo, guitar, anything. I have a question. Um, so one of your banjos it has two tuning knobs on the higher string, or is it just a tuning knob and a keeper? It's, a, it's just different styles of it. So the tuners here, these are open kind of style. These are geared internally. Same, same concept. You can look at it closer in a minute. Same concept, same idea. It's just done differently. But the, the high string has the... Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I got you. I got you. That's a fifth string capo. So instead of having to retune this one, I can pull it up here and go... Oh. Oh, okay. And tune it like that. So, yeah, that's what I'm sorry. That's what you're talking about, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, makes it easier. Any other questions? Yeah. Did the upright bass enter into any of the old time 
about the same time the guitar did. Uh, it's it's big thing was it was big, and it was very costly too. You know, and uh, a lot of times you'd have some people in the community that could fix a fiddle or something, <coughs> but if you brought a bass in, that's a whole other aspect. I mean, it made probably in the 20s and 30s when the Carter family started recording and recording became popular. Some of this. Uh, um, Dick Burnett and Lynn Rutherford time period, it would have came into play. But before that, traditional styling, not at all that I know of. And even then, when it did come in, they actually did have some recordings from those days, the 20s and 30s, where they actually bowed it. Instead of plucking like bluegrass would have been, not all the time, it would have been plucked as well, but a very unique sound, though. Anything else? So where are you playing next? I don't know. So I had a great band. I had a great band. Uh, and my fiddle player, moved to East Tennessee to work with State Parks over there, and my banjo guitar player has moved to Portland, Oregon. So we're scattered across the country right now. Um, I don't know, I'll play, I'll play anywhere you want me to. <laughs> yeah. Aside from just the string instruments, what other instruments did they play? Um, you know, there were some, some flutes and tin whistles. The tin whistles came over from Ireland. Um, there's not a lot of record of them being played as much. I don't, I don't know why either, because they were so prominent in early Irish music. Um, it might have just been scarcity. You know, it may have came over on the boats with them, but not have survived the journey out here. So, I really don't know. Other than these instruments, that's all I really know about. What about the jaw harp? The jaw harp, of course, yeah. <laughs> that dates back at least four or five hundred years, actually. It's one of the oldest. Oldest. Chili's a good player, by the way, at that. We might have figured out how to play together before we get here. Uh, okay, we'll <laughs> Any more questions about anything? Any instruments? Anything? So, if, if I understood it correctly, and I, I might be mistaken, uh, the fiddle was considered a primary instrument. Yes. Is, and do you owe that to its size and portability? Yes. And, you know, the fiddle in its form right here on this table is pretty much the same form it had three, four hundred years ago. They knew this, this thing evolved in the 1800s, you know, late 1700s tops. So this guy had its form. Everybody knew how to play it. When it came over, you, this guy doesn't, I mean, you can't, you can dance to that, but, but not like an old fiddle tune that you heard from Ireland or something like that. Not the same. Um, that's actually a really good question. I don't know why the real prominence of it, other than it was the melody carrier. And this was the rhythm instrument. Anything else? I've got another one. Yeah. Um, this might kind of piggyback on Chili's question here, but where did the origination of a lack of percussion come from in traditional bluegrass instrumentation? You don't have your drums, your cymbals, maybe a washboard or something, but right. lack of general lack of percussion. I don't know why they didn't make it in this style of music because it was also prominent in Irish music as well, and, and African music, you know. They had the boron in Irish music that was so popular. We see no record of that. I mean, other than like what I was doing a minute ago, where you got the keeping the beat like that. There's no record of somebody getting together with a drummer. It's not mentioned anywhere that I've seen it. And that's a good question too. Do you think it was a prominence of string players? Or possibly, possibly. Or if you know, drums, they might have the You never know. <laughs> 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 absolutely, absolutely. Native Americans were very. You gotta think though, at this time period in the 1830s, 1700s, when they're moving in, they're a lot of times still doing hostile natives. So anything, they're not, only a few select ones who had really good relationships with it where they would have adopted things like that. And we still always, we don't know exactly which tribes used drums, some of that stuff's lost to history. Yeah. How often would you find old time music being played without dancing? Was it all in your hand? No, I would imagine there were performances like the, the, the solo fiddle pieces that Clyde Davenport that learned from his family. That would have not been dance teams whatsoever. That would have been, and I don't know where they would have performed it at. I don't know what circumstance, unless they were literally doing it for money on the courthouse square like Burnett and Rutherford did. Um, but yeah, a lot of times there was music just for the sake of music without having a, a dance associated with it. Usually I think what happened is maybe they started that way and then moonshine started flowing and the next thing everybody's dancing. I don't know. <laughs> 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 Anything else? Yeah. 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 And like I said, you're welcome to come in here. Look, I've got all these albums up here. They're very neat to look at. Flip them over. Check them out. If you've got questions about my instruments, I want to look at them. Uh, and I'll play anything. If you ride down the $100 bill, any request you want, <laughs> set it in my case, and you're good to go. Thank you, Seth. <laughs>